Vamos, ready? Yes. Guys, from the Bitcoin Amsterdam, I'm here with legendary cryptocurrency researcher Sergio. How are you doing today? Great, Mauricio. Thanks for this podcast. It's a pleasure. I know you don't do this very often, so I'm yeah. super, super glad we're doing this today. But before we dive into it, can you give us a little bit of a, a background about you? Yeah, so my background is in computer security, cybersecurity. And I was working on, on decentralized uh, applications before Bitcoin was created. Essentially, I was working on decentralized poker playing. And, and for playing poker in a decentralized way, you basically need a decentralized currency. So back in 2008, I was in the cypherpunk forums trying to create or see if someone had created a decentralized currency. But it was not actually 2000, it was in 2011 that somebody called me and told me, hey Sergio, for your project, this is the coin that could work. And that was Bitcoin. So uh, what the first thing I did is try to break it because any, per any person that works in computer security, they love breaking stuff. Yeah. So actually the call was not as mature as it is today. There was a lot less people skilled people looking at the code. And so I started to find vulnerabilities in the code. And I, I think I found eight almost critical vulnerabilities in the Bitcoin code at that time. So I became a contributor to the Bitcoin core in a sense of trying to uh, report, responsibly report vulnerabilities and, and, and try to understand more and more how Bitcoin work. Uh, but, but the, I, I never bought Bitcoin at that, that time. That's the, 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 the funny thing. I was not interested in Bitcoin as, as money or even as a store of value. That concept came much later. I was interested in technology and in security. I love this. I mean, do you see after many years of, of course, contribution, you found many vulnerabilities in the Bitcoin core and helped patching them up. Amazing. Do you still see Bitcoin as a currency or more as a store of value? Well, it completely changed, right? Um, I, I, I was present uh, and, and, and in the debates in the block size wars, and I, I understand that the decision of the community was to go in the base layer, in the L1, towards um, uh, a, um, a store of value, which I think is great as long as you can create layers on top of Bitcoin that allows you to use Bitcoin as a currency. Um, I come from a country, South America, that has very high inflation, capital controls, uh, bank uh, um, uh, closing, uh, it, it preventing people from taking out the money from the bank, all kinds of, of government interference in, in, in the liberty of people to, to move their money. So for Argentinians, it's, it's very clear that Bitcoin should also work for uh, savings and, and, and payments and basically creating a new financial system that is inclusive and that, that can, you know, bring all these people to, to, to success, to a global economy that the current system prevents. So for, for me, from, our, from my country, it was very clear that Bitcoin could not be only a soft value. It should be much more. Makes sense. I mean, you've been here from basically day one or day zero. Do you think it's still early for Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Maybe you hear in Bitcoin Amsterdam, you hear a lot of people trying to predict what is going to happen in 2050 with Bitcoin. But essentially, either Bitcoin goes to infinity or it goes to zero, right? It's very, it's, it's, it's very improbable that it keeps in the same price. Like, so you can take your bets, right? Uh, I try not to bet, but, but, but yeah, the, 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 the thing is that hyper-Bitcoinization, it's possibility. You can assign it any... You know, any number to it, but it's essentially it's, it's a real possibility because of network effect, of money and of hard money. So yeah, I should, you should plan. I agree. I think one Bitcoin equal one Bitcoins, right? So stack stats and take notes. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the Pentoshi paper you wrote. Yeah. Where was the inspiration from? I mean, you've done a ton of research on the matter, right? Yeah. So actually it was 2013. I had been working, trying to improve Bitcoin for two years, and I actually didn't own any Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, so, so at that time, um, some, some, the, 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 uh, an institution, an organization that was called the Bitcoin Foundation at that time, they offered me a job to audit all the releases of Bitcoin code. Uh, it, it was a paid job, and they, they offered me to pay me in Bitcoin. 
And so I, I had to do some research to, to really understand if that was, what should I do with the Bitcoin, right? I mean, if, if, if there was a way or someone that could control the market, then maybe it, it wasn't worth it. So I, I just made very simple back of the envelope calculation. I say, okay, if Satoshi had was mining during the whole first year, then he will have um, saved 1 million Bitcoin. It was very easy, just, just uh, you know, predicting, uh, keeping the hash rate, strategic hash rate for a whole year, you get 1 million Bitcoin. So I, I just posted that on Bitcoin talk forums and people were kind of angry at me because the, it, it was kind of an heretic thing to say about, you know, Satoshi. And so I, I decided to try to find proof of that. So I, I went to my home, I started looking at how the early blocks were created and I found a pattern, a pattern related to a bug in the, in the first Bitcoin call that basically there was a counter that it was never reset and that allows you to correlate the different coin bases of, of, of different blocks. And that led me to this, what I call later the Patoshi pattern. And the name Patoshi, which is basically pattern of Satoshi, yeah. was uh, I decided to put it a name to prevent people from what from I mean I, I wanted to make the 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 talk about this this pattern very technical and, and not philosophical. Like I, I don't mind who Satoshi is. I don't want to know what Satoshi is, but I do mind what happened with these coin bases because that that has an effect on the market. And there was two essential two discoveries. One, that Satoshi owned 1.1 million Bitcoins, and the other, that he never spent them when they had real value. Like, he only spent some when there was no value and he was just testing the network. So that fact that Satoshi was the biggest whale, the biggest believer, the biggest holder, uh, the, 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 the information that it brought to the market was more trust, and actually the, the price of Bitcoin went up. Like, 10% that day because of this announcement. So essentially, I think it's, it's information that was valuable to the community. And it happened a few days ago that a guy approached me and told me that he was orange peeing when he, he learned about, uh, about, about my, my, my research on, on, on Patoshi. And, and then I realized that it was good, right? At, at, the point, at that point in time, if, if, I, if I read my article again, I was very dubious what would be the effect on that article, but now I'm, I'm sure that it, the, the overall effect is good. Obviously, it was taken by, you know, Carl Wright to, 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 to try to steal the, the Satoshi's identity, yeah. but who could have known that that, that scummy thing would, would have happened? I wouldn't have known about that, but, but yes. And, and afterwards, there was many other researchers who re redid the, my research and and check it and found very other interesting things. So now it's not only my research, it's a group of people uh, like Jameson Lop, Tech Mix, a guy whose alias is Organ of Conti, Big Mac Research, and there is a recent paper. So all of them uh, checked it and they, they found the same information that I did. So you're the fire starter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but now it's more common, common knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. Makes sense. And by the way, I will link in the comments down below the paper, which is unbelievable. And I would like to ask you, why do you think Satoshi left 1.1 million Bitcoin? Well, I don't think he had a reason to need them. Like, what, what we know about Calvo, the way he mined, he tried to bring other miners into the system. Like, he made pauses of five minutes every time he mined a block, trying to bring other people to mine the following block. So... If we analyze all his mining activity, and, and there was previous, well, when he detected that the network was increasing the hash rate, he would reduce his hash rate. So it, it looks like a very altruistic pattern of, of behavior. So I think that he never meant to use them. It was more than how to bootstrap the network security. It was very important at the beginning not to let anyone reverse the chain, right? Yeah. So I think it's just, if you look at all these elements, you see that there is a part of altruistic behavior, and he never meant to spend them. That's my, my view. Makes sense. I love it. And of course, you're now with Ustock, and yeah. today you guys have made a fantastic announcement about DMS going open source. Yes. Rootstock is was the first, uh, and is the first uh, Bitcoin sidechain, 
uh, Rootstock is merged mine with Bitcoin. More than, uh, I think, 60% of Bitcoin miners are merged mining Rootstock. And Rootstock has breached one of the first federated breach uh, that we, we, I built in 2016. And it's one of the most secure ones because it uses a federation which of HSM devices, each one of the device holding a private key and running inside the device a uh, Rooster Light client that follows the hash rate and you can never extract the key from the device. You, you cannot back up the keys from the device. So it's very secure. But the Bitcoin community and more importantly, the Bitcoin Maxis, they see that this is not a permissionless system. Even if it's secure, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for them to you know believe that this system is permissionless because you know there is a federation and the federation who, who who names, who, who decides who is part of the federation. So that's a, a key, I would say, friction point. So um, some time ago, in October 2023, Robin Linus created a new design, a new way to build bridges that is much more decentralized for, than a classical federation. So we decided to take the lead and, and be at the forefront of this technology and build uh, what we call BBMX, which is basically a framework for running smart contracts on Bitcoin uh, in what we call like a, a disputable computing or also called optimistic computing that allows you to run any contract, like you can write your contract in Rust or in Z++ and run them on Bitcoin, basically verify them on Bitcoin, but basically you can uh, decide to spend funds or not based on more complex programs. And uh, this can serve many use cases, like uh, it can be used for more private payment channels, for channel factories, for the centralized exchanges. I mean, there's a ton of use cases you can use B uh, BitBMX for, but the main motivation for Rootstock to, to collaborate in this project is because you can use BitBMX to build a more decentralized bridge. So uh, this is the BitBMX is collaboration between Fairgate Labs and Rootstock Labs. And now that it's been open source, we expect to get much more collaboration from anyone from the community, and maybe with new use cases, new ideas. And we will try to keep it neutral, to keep it, you know, as free and as collaborative project as possible. And maybe it's a piece of uh, Bitcoin future and and the common uh, the common good, right? I love this. Thank you, by the way, for all the contribution, everything you've done for the Bitcoin community and the core itself. And I also think scalability layer twos built on Bitcoin are definitely needed to take us to the yeah. next level, right? Have you found friction from some of the old OG Bitcoiners? On well, the yeah. So first of all, Rootstock was the first, um, the first blockchain to inherit it, I would say, to take the EVM virtual machine and move it into another coin, another uh, and a native coin, which in case of Rootstock is Bitcoin. And for many Bitcoiners in the early time, this was very strange to bring, you know, a foreign technology that was built on Ethereum into Bitcoin. And what I what I said at those times was, the the real machine is not the, the real important thing. You can you, the important thing is getting the developers on board, right? So if they have chosen the EVM as a standard virtual machine, then just use that virtual machine. Let th there will be time for improvement there. If, if there is some security concerns, I'm pretty sure that we can get to consensus how to fix them, how to improve them. But essentially, any virtual machine can emulate any other virtual machine. So, you know, if you if you really want to have a um, uh, language that you know uh, that uh, domain specific language with the formal proofs, you can actually run that on top of uh, of, of, of of a contract written in in for the EVM. So essentially, it is just a layer where you can build stuff. So I think that it's now that there are more than a thousand chains that they are running on EVM, I think it was a good choice. And maybe Bitcoiners are not so reluctant to program on EVM. But yeah, at the beginning, it was kind of a strange decision for them. I love that you made it open source. I'm a big believer in building and launching something in the open. And then people are going to start building on top of each other and then magic happens. So, so yeah, so ne the next step, we are working on the Union Bridge, mm -hmm. which is the bridge that we are going to propose to the Rooster community uh, in the following month. We are ver working very hard on the designers. We have started to code. And 
every every week we get a new innovation. Like it's a very fast moving field because all this technology is so new that uh, I, I, what I presented a, a few weeks ago, it's already overridden with new, better, better way of doing stuff. So it's, it's very, it's amazing what we can do. So the next step obviously would be um, open sourcing the, the Union Bridge and let anyone, you know, collaborate. Amazing. Sergio, gracias. Gracias a lot. A pleasure Thank talking you. to you. Guys, I will link in the comments down below Sergio's profile and of course the paper you wrote on the Pintoshi. So thank you so much for watching. See you on the next one. Thanks.